I mean, he was the focal point at all times. And what seems so amazing is that he somehow, because acid is a very powerful drug, and it's like, you, I don't, I would feel like totally out of control, and yet I would watch him and he would seem totally in control. One of the things when I look back, I realize I didn't always see him take acid. I don't think he did. The idea was to get rid of all the conditioning, to die in yourself. So he would hold you up and say something to you. Say, see, I can see your mother on you. It's still the conditioning, you know? You haven't gotten rid of it. You're not dead yet. Sometimes he would reenact the crucifixion when we were on LSD. And it was very realistic. I would die for you. And then the questions would begin, um, would you die for me? And what was the philosophy that Manson was offering? It had begun with a notion of oneness and the power of love. But over time, it grew steadily more paranoid. The messages to the family grew steadily darker. There was no right or wrong. And life and death were really the same thing. In fact, death could be a welcome step on the way to a better world. And in the fall and winter of 1968, as Manson saw himself more and more a lone visionary, he and the family spent more and more time in a place that only increased their sense of isolation, a remote outpost in Death Valley, Barker Ranch. We really weren't in touch. We were allowed to listen to the Beatles and the Moody Blues and Manson's music. Nonetheless, Manson was aware of what was going on in the nation's cities. Since 1966, city after city had seen rioting in black neighborhoods. The cry for black power was being heard alongside the ever stronger actions against the war in Vietnam. Because if America don't come round, America should be burnt down. The family moved back to Los Angeles in January of 1969. Then the paranoia increased even more in early July, when Manson thought he'd killed a black drug dealer he also thought was a Black Panther. Now convinced that the full fury of the Panthers was soon to descend on the family, bitter about his failure to record his music, and most importantly, certain that a giant race war was impending, Charles Manson spent July and early August tense, paranoid, and angry. On the night of August 9, 1969, at a house on Cielo Drive in Los Angeles, actress Sharon Tate, wife of movie director Roman Polanski and eight months pregnant, was at home with her friends, the hairstylist Jay Sebring, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and Roman's friend Wojtek Frykowski. A young man named Stephen Parent was also on the site, visiting the home's caretaker. That night's murders began with some preparations at Spawn Ranch. I was with the children. We were in a trailer. I was with someone else, and we were in a trailer. And Charlie came and woke me up. And he said, get up. I want you to go somewhere. He said, get in the car. And I was in the car with Tex and Linda Kasabian and Susan Atkins. And he said, do everything the text says. And we were off. Tex Watson went onto the property first. When he came upon Stephen Parent in his car, he shot him four times. We heard gunshots. He came back and told us to come with him. And we followed. Trying to get into the house, he eventually, I think he like went through a window or something, returned to a front door and allowed the rest of us to enter. There was a man that he was dealing with, and I think that was um, Jay Sebring, I believe. Uh, he had him on the floor or something, and he was going to, like, tie him up. And he asked Susan to check the back rooms. And what began to happen is a scuffle started taking place between Tex and um, the man and Jay, Jay Sebring. And, he, and he shot him, and everyone else at that point obviously was, was getting really frightened and scared. And what eventually took place is that there was an attempt to tie, tie everyone up. And 
when there was a, an attempt to tie everyone up, eventually um, Abigail Folger started to get herself undone, and she took off. I ran after her with an upraised knife, and we went out through a back door out onto the lawn, and I started stabbing her. I, I, I ran her down, and I began to stab her. I remember her saying, I'm already dead. It was Tex Watson who delivered most of the fatal blows at the house that night. We, we, we just, we were so locked in like, it's just like, okay, okay, this must be, this, I mean, you just become more in, in more like a robot, like somehow this must bring it. The scene left behind was grotesque. There was blood everywhere. A rope tied twice around Sharon Tate's neck was looped over a beam and tied around Jay Sebring's neck. Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski lay on the front lawn. Stephen Parent lay dead in his car. And on the front door in Sharon Tate's blood was the word pig. Besides being shot and bludgeoned, the victims had been stabbed a total of 102 times. When I got back to the ranch, we got out of the car. Charlie came up and asked everybody how it went. But that was the first time I looked at him and I said, Charlie, they were so young. And he just said, go with Tex. The next night, another attack. This time, it was at the home of grocery company executive Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary in a very different section of Los Angeles. Manson knew the house because he'd attended a party at a neighboring home in the past. Along this second night would be Leslie Van Houten, anxious to prove her loyalty to Manson. I knew that people would die. I knew that there would be killing. Manson, Van Houten, Krenwinkel, Watson, Atkins, and Linda Kasabian drove around for a while before they stopped at the LaBianca house. Manson went inside, tied up the LaBiancas, and then left. Pat had a knife. And I tried to hold Mrs. LaBianca down, and I couldn't do it. And Pat went to stab her, and she couldn't do it. Leslie was still trying to hold her because she was struggling. And I went and got Tex. And Tex went into the bedroom. And I stood in the hallway. And I looked into an empty room in the den. And I just stayed there, and I didn't move. And I have no sound memory of um, Mrs. LaBianca dying. I, I, all I remember is staring into that room. And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And, um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. The scene at the LaBiancas was no less macabre than that at the Tate House. A carving fork protruded from Lino LaBianca's stomach and a knife from his throat. And the word war was carved in his flesh. Mrs. LaBianca was in the bedroom, her head covered by a pillowcase with a lamp cord tied around her neck. On the walls, written in their blood, were the words, Death to Pigs, and Rise. And on the refrigerator door, the words, Helter Skelter. I said, if you're going to do something, leave something witchy. Just like I would tell you, if you're going to do something, do it well. And leave something witchy. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Have a good day. The two victims had been stabbed a total of 67 times. Meanwhile, the news of the first night's murders had hit L.A. like an earthquake. There was a, a terrible fear, a terrible a trepidation on the part of the Hollywood community that this killing, this ritualistic killing, had something to do with celebrityism. And so a lot of the high-profile Hollywood stars, uh, apparently Sinatra left town, Tony Bennett was living at the Beverly Hills Hotel in one of the bungalows who he 